I don't know about all of you, but I was worried I won't be able to speak after that meditation. <laughs> Everything slowed down. So for those who think that I speak too fast, you may be now pleased that I speak more slowly. And for those who think that I speak too slowly, then um, you might think that I speak even more slowly. <laughs> but nevertheless, it is as it is. And we are now on the second noble truth. So we finished the first noble truth, which I really want to congratulate you on, because it isn't easy sometimes to be confronted with this. And probably one of the reasons is because we know it's true, right? If it wasn't true, we'd be thinking, hmm, never mind, I have fun, you know, everything's fine in my life. But you're all here, so you know that it could be better. And there's a reason for that. So now we're going to look at the origin, the noble truth of the origin of suffering and find out a little more about why. And as usual, I think it's really um, important and helpful to relate this to not only our lives outside in the world, but also the meditation, um, because this is where we can see wanting in action, you know, and it can be very subtle. And you may realize that when you practice that. You know, there are obstacles along the way, and yes, it can be the hindrances, but most often it's it's usually either the ill will or the wanting. And of course, even ill will is a kind of wanting things to change, right? We're not happy with what is, so we want something different. So really, this wanting is one of the root causes, along with delusion, for why we suffer so much. So I think that's one of the reasons I was so happy at the end of the meditation, because Ajahn was really guiding us to be content. And of course, contentment is a direct antidote to that wanting, that craving. If we're content, then what is there to want? You know? Absolute contentment is freedom from wanting. And sometimes people think that's dull, but I can't think of anything more beautiful than being fully content, really satiated. And it's interesting that the word for wanting in uh, the Pali is actually thirst. Tanha literally means thirst. So the opposite of that is being quenched, being satiated, wanting nothing more at all. So we'll begin. It's page 15 today in the word of the Buddha. And um, it begins with the threefold wanting or the threefold thirst, if you like. Usually this is translated as craving, but the reason Ajahn prefers to translate it as wanting is because wanting is perhaps a little bit more innocuous. It's maybe not, doesn't have such strong connotations as outright craving for something. The word craving makes it sound like you're really after something, whereas wanting is a little bit more subtle as well. It covers the whole range. So this is from the Samyutta Nikaya, number 56, verse 11. Now, this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this wanting which leads to rebirth, accompanied by enjoyment and desire, seeking delight now here, now there. That is, wanting related to the five senses. In Pali, that's bara, sorry, karma tanha, karma k a long a m a, not kama cause and effect but karma wanting to be that's bhavatanha and wanting not to be vibhavatanha or annihilation it's interesting isn't it that we seek delight now here now there that really stands out to me as i read it now you know just how we kind of keep on one minute one thing appeals the next minute that sort of loses its appeal and we go after something else you know we're always running around kind of somewhat aimlessly, really, never really finding satisfaction. Nothing lasts. So, you know, once we've had, say, a big plate of fish and chips, that's not what you want for dinner the next day. You want something different, you know? And even your favorite chocolate, if you have too much of it, you just end up feeling sick. So we have to keep on changing those objects of desire, which is already a bit of a red flag, isn't it? If it really was fulfilling, then you could do it once and that would be that. I remember saying to my parents who like to go on these uh, very luxurious cruises, perhaps they think they're ordinary, but to me, they'd be a luxury. Like, oh, OK, so if it was really great, so you don't need to go again next year. You've been. <laughs> Aren't you happy now? 
<laughs> but they didn't really get the point and they were like oh what's she talking about you know the more the better but uh of course that just keeps us so busy in this world so wanting to wanting related to the five senses this is quite obvious isn't it like we live in the five sense world so nearly everything that we want is related to either sight sound smell taste or touch unless it's enlightenment <laughs> which is another kind of wanting of course because for us that's just a concept we don't really know what we're wanting and then this wanting to be is kind of like chasing your own tail if you're a dog I mean we don't we're not dogs so it's probably hard to relate to but <laughs> you just go round and round and round you know creating more and more rebirth and then this wanting not to be of course this can manifest as things like suicide right or thoughts of suicide thoughts of wanting to annihilate oneself and it's still based on the delusion of a self because if there's only a process there then why do we need to crave to get rid of that you know it's a process it'll end on it in its own time anyway so Ajahn Brahm always talks about this wanting not to be as like trying to eat your own head you can't actually do it it's impossible because if you do commit suicide you know you'll only end up getting reborn it's not actually a way out of suffering and this is very important to remember not to um you know sometimes people think especially when they've been studying Buddhism in traditional uh countries perhaps that suicide is this terrible um yeah heinous crime and and the person's bound to go to a lower realm but one of the lovely things at the start of this tour was um Ajahn Brown met a family who had recently lost their son to suicide 16 year old son obviously extremely tragic and this family were very distressed but he gave a beautiful talk and a lot of counsel to this family mainly to tell them that you know he'd done so many wonderful things in his life he'd been such a wonderful son and done well at school had lots of loving friends and loving siblings and you know just that one act of suicide at the end of his life was one mistake only one out of all the things he'd done right all the wonderful things he'd done in his life and so you know it doesn't mean you're going to get a terrible rebirth if somebody does lose their life to suicide it's one moment of despair you know out of so many moments and so many beautiful things that a person's done but it does mean that you're going to come back again at some point and that you haven't really ended suffering that way so it's not the way out so the next little bit is the origin of wanting and this is from the digger nikaya number 22 i don't know what uh the sutta's called but you can look it up later if you wish and where does this wanting arise and become established? Whatever in the, wherever in the world there is anything agreeable and pleasurable, there this wanting arises and becomes established. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tangibles, and mind objects in the world are agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. So again, this is the six senses now, and it's including the mind objects. So our wanting is always in relation to one of these six. And the reason that, you know, the wanting arises is because, of course, there is some happiness there. And the Buddha does talk about the gratification uh, in the senses and even in the mind, of course, and the danger and the escape. Interestingly, as far as I understand it, he only really talks about the danger of um, wanting when it's related to the five senses of course there's a danger in craving for meditation states because it's going to create suffering if they don't arise and it's not the path but the actual pleasure of the mind is not something to be feared as we've spoken about before so he goes further sight sound smells oh no i said that one the next is the six consciousnesses so this is the consciousness that arises dependent on those six senses sight hearing smell taste touch and mind consciousness are agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established experience of the six senses is agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established so that's interesting actually because experience is the translation for vedana here which is um also sometimes translated as feeling or affective tone of experience or even sensation um, which is more related to the body 
but um obviously there are unpleasant sensations too right and yet here the buddha saying you know experience of the six senses is agreeable and pleasurable so does that only mean the pleasant experience or also the neutral ones or even the unpleasant ones i don't know about you but i've often found myself somehow perversely even craving for suffering and it's subtle it's not like oh please suffering come to me but have you noticed that sometimes the sense of self would rather be stuck in its own suffering than not to feel anything at all? This is really an interesting and curious aspect of the human state, I think, that, you know, we'd rather some experience than not to feel, which is, of course, why it's sometimes scary to get into these deeper states of meditation, because it's unknown territory where we don't feel our self in quite the same way as usual. And it's a little bit... Um, intimidating in a sense like who are you you know if you just absorb into the light who are you where are you you don't even know where you exist in space and time so then the next one is the perception of sights sounds smells tastes touches and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable and there this wanting arises and becomes established so we want to perceive we want to experience we want to be conscious and then will in regard to sight, sound, smells, taste, touches and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. So that's pretty straightforward. But the next one's very interesting. The wanting of sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there this wanting arises and becomes established. So we actually want to want. <laughs> And in a way, this is where the problem lies. Again, this is bhava tanha, right? Craving to be, but craving to want. <laughs> we want to want because it gives us this sense of like perhaps achieving something or like we want because then things will get better and we think that, you know. But even the wanting in and of itself is a kind of addiction. We crave to crave just for the sake of craving because then we feel that we exist, right? And sometimes people are really scared of where's like contentment, because if you're content, like, where's the place for self? Like, what do you do? What is the to do? There's nothing to do. And in a sense, it's only when we get that taste for the beauty of contentment, the beauty of peace. It's a certain refined taste that we can realize this wanting is actually not our friend at all. And then the next one is the thinking of sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and mind objects that's agreeable and pleasurable. And there, this wanting arises and becomes established. That's uh, Vitaka. And lastly, fantasizing about sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and mind objects is agreeable and pleasurable. And there, this wanting arises and becomes established. So I'm not sure what the word, the Pali word for fantasizing is. I asked Ajahn Brahm and he had forgotten how he translated it, but it could be also, it could be papancha, which means proliferation or is often translated as proliferation. So it's the kind of building it up in your mind, you know, fantasizing, creating it to be something much more important in a sense than it really is. And um, yeah, just adding so much to what's really there. I don't know about people here, but when I first started going on retreats, there was this phenomenon of the kind of vipassana mind, they used to call it, because they call the retreats vipassana, which actually means insight. So you can't really say a technique is insight. It's more about does insight arise or not. But um, one of the things that would happen, you know, for me anyway, is, for example, I did my second retreat in Kathmandu, and in Kathmandu you could get all these amazing cakes, even in the 90s, like big carrot cakes and fudge cakes, chocolate cakes. You couldn't get that kind of thing in India. So, <laughs> And then in the meditation, you'd be sort of dreaming, oh, afterwards I'm going to go and get that big cake, you know, maybe a slice of this or a slice of that. And, of course, when you went to get the cake and ate it, it was like... Okay, <laughs> so you chew it in your mouth, it tastes kind of a bit drier than you expected, maybe not quite as gooey and fudgy and chocolatey. And afterwards, like, so what, you know, and that was very interesting, because during the retreat, it showed you that you'd actually got a sense for the beauty of equanimity, the beauty of peace. And now you didn't really need to have this like stimulation of the taste sense. It was actually not as exciting as you you'd built up in your mind. 
So, so much of the time we're just like wanting things that don't really exist at all. And we just imagine they're there. And in a sense, it's an escape from the suffering, the discontent that we feel, right? So shall I continue? Because I'm determined today to get through the second noble truth. Um, and then I'll ask for some questions in a while. So the next part is the dependent origination of all phenomena. So on seeing a sight, and the same with the other six senses. So seeing a sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or mind object, you want it if it's pleasing, and you try to get rid of it if it's unpleasing. <laughs> Pretty obvious, but it seems that this is what we do all of our life. Like the human being is basically primed to be the bringing something towards, trying to grab it and pull it in or pushing something away. And we're almost programmed to do that unconsciously, I would say. And then you abide with mindfulness and wisdom of the five senses or body, of the five senses, yeah, the body, unestablished, with a limited mind, and you do not understand as it actually is, the liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom wherein those deceiving and oppressive states cease without remainder. So this is the problem with craving and aversion or wanting and aversion, negativity, dislike. You know, it only really happens when our mindfulness and wisdom are not established. The mind is limited or contracted. And we cannot understand as it actually is the liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom wherein these de deceiving and oppressive states cease without remainder. So this liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom are basically one and the same thing, but liberation of mind refers more to the jhana states, including the four arupas. So these are the, not really eight jhanas, the four jhanas and the four arupas is how they're described in the suttas. And that leads, of course, to the wisdom. So liberation by wisdom still includes the four jhanas, but not necessarily the four arupas. And of course, it's actually possible to attain liberation or be liberated, let's say, to stream winning, even without all four jhanas, as long as there's some experience of deep meditation enough that the five hindrances are suppressed or um, I prefer pacified or overcome for some time and usually it would take more than one experience but it's possible you know if your wisdom is very very strong <clears throat> so then engaged as you are in favoring and opposing other words for trying to get rid of and pulling toward whatever experience vedana you have <clears throat> whether pleasant or painful or neutral you delight in that experience <clears throat> excuse me, welcome it and remain holding to it. As you do so, delight arises in you. Now, delight in experience, Vedana, is a fuel. With fuel, and that's the translation for upadana, which is often uh, translated as attachment, with fuel as a condition, states of existence develop. That's bhava. With states of existence as condition, rebirth. With rebirth as condition, aiding and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, negativity and distress come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. So this is the dependent origination in brief from the point of Vedana experience. And this is an important link in that chain because it's where we can have a direct experience of what's happening. We can feel it in the body and the mind. We can have, actually, the word Vedana, um, as far as I understand it, does mean experience, like direct experience, because the Vedas also are kind of knowledge, like the, the um, Hindu word Vedas. It means experiential knowledge, in a sense. So this is why it's so important, because it's much more tangible and much more, in a sense, graspable <clears throat> than concepts like Vijnana, which is consciousness. Like, that's much harder to understand and experience. So this is dependent origination in brief, how from the Vedana we react, basically, we welcome it, remain holding to it, delight arises. So again, it's interesting because it's saying even with the unpleasant, delight arises. 
right? There's some kind of reaction on our part, there's some kind of holding, pushing, some kind of interference, and then we develop states of existence. And we actually create those states of existence in our mind. Sometimes people think they're realms in other places. I don't know if that's maybe true as well, but we can create them and they seem to be almost infinite. You know, the amount of states of existence we can create for ourselves because maybe we think we deserve them or maybe we resonate with particular states and get attached to them. And we create the places that we think will find happiness, of course, right? Or even places that we think will get what we deserve in terms of a punishment, like a hell. So that finishes the first page. And before we carry on, I'd like to ask if there are any questions so far. Okay, wonderful. I see a question coming. <clears throat> Dear Venerable, this is a question about suicide. Isn't the last thought that identifies with, that one identifies with, leads to the next birth? The traditional Asian view is based on anger, sadness, etc a person likely feels may lead a person to a lower realm. So yeah, this is, I think, coming from the Abhidhamma about mind moments. And in the Abhidhamma, it definitely emphasizes the importance of the last mind moment. But the way I understand it from the suttas is a little bit different. Firstly, it doesn't emphasize mind moments, and it doesn't even claim to sort of say that it's possible to know what the last mind moment is, because the thing about death is it's a process. It's not an instantaneous um, event, and we can never really be sure what a person's last mind moment is. There's a bit of a stage, it seems, a bit of a process between the time the body dies and you're actually dead. <laughs> and this is the, re the point that we can't really say about suicide. I mean, it might be that at that moment that a person makes a decision to take their life and actually, you know, perpetrates that violence towards their own body, we might think that's the last moment, but how do we know? The mind could continue for several more mind moments after that, and we really don't know. I mean, when you look at things like uh, near-death experiences, and there are whole books documenting these, I haven't read them all, I have to confess, um, it seems that people who've had very average lives, you know, maybe not been particularly moral people in their lives, still, they can go into these beautiful places, maybe sometimes meadows or places with beautiful, you know, sunny. I've heard a lot of experiences about meadows, actually flower filled meadows and sunshine and places where people feel utterly at peace. And so this is quite possible um, that a person can continue like this and and. As I understand the Dhamma, you know, it's the whole sum total of a person's life, a person's kusala kamma, if you like, that determines the rebirth. Like, which way have you been mainly inclining in in your life? Because that's really what's going to influence the rebirth more than anything else. Of course, though, and until we're actually stream winners, there's a possibility we can go to a lower realm. So we do have to be uh, careful and diligent and keep practicing. So long as we know that we still have that sense of self. <clears throat> Dear Venerable, I used to love traveling, so it seemed the more holidays, the better. Then I managed to go on a sabbatical leave, which left me bored and bewildered. Now I want to want it, but I know it does not deliver. Oh, that's so interesting. You want to want it. <laughs> that's very honest, right? We wish that there was some happiness there, <laughs> but we actually know that there isn't. Yeah, but I know it doesn't deliver. Not sure what to make of it. Thank you for this lovely retreat. Yeah, probably what to make of it is that it's just a habit. You know, it's just habit energy that you're used to wanting to want stuff. So that just comes up naturally because perhaps you haven't found like full contentment without that wanting yet. So it's just like, you know, the mind continues in its old patterns. And yet somehow there's this wisdom that's arisen in you through your practice and through your indirect experience of uh, the boredom of sabbaticals <laughs> that uh, somehow cuts through that a little bit. So I think it's just about, you know, being reconditioned and that conditioning becomes more and more powerful and you start to delight more and more in the practice and, and the simpler pleasures. I think it's a very good thing, you know, when you can experience happiness with less. 
I remember years and years ago, I was doing a Pali retreat, Pali course in uh, Damagiri. It's uh, the main Vipassana center um, that Goenkaji started in India. And it was in 2001. And um, I had a few very good Dhamma sisters there with me. And it was one of them's 30th birthday. And, you know, you, you basically have the same food every day normally, the rice dal, a bit of curry and chapatis. And very nice, actually, wholesome food. But what, on her birthday, we had like a few boiled sweets and we were opening them as if they were like these precious gems. And my friend just made this comment, oh, I'm 30 years old and I can be so happy with one sweet. And I remember that being almost like an exclamation of happiness and contentment. And it was so uplifting. You know, we really were so happy to be there, to be serving, to be studying the Pali and having so much time to meditate in this amazing Dhamma Center with people from all over the world. You know, it was just so wonderful. And that one suite was enough. We didn't need to go anywhere. We didn't need to do anything else that was special. Yeah. So, so I think it's wonderful. <laughs> Good. So next question, when suicide is caused by mental illness, a chemical imbalance, then surely there'd be no penalty. Exactly. Reincarnating in a lower realm. Yeah. And I mean, you know, most depression will have some chemical imbalance associated with it. Right. I mean, what are we made of other than Rupa and, you know, the mind affects the, the body and the body affects the mind. So it's all interrelated. And often it is a chemical imbalance. Um, it's an illness. It's not a sign of anybody being bad or evil or, you know, anything like that. So there's no, I mean, we can't say there's no kind of ethical aspect to it, but I don't think it would overcome and sort of annihilate all the good stuff. That's not really possible. I mean, the Buddha said that karma has to be re-experienced in the same manner that it was kind of planted in. So you're still going to get all the fruits of the wholesome deeds that you've done. You know, and who knows? I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen to a person after death. It's much more complicated than simply one act. I mean, how many lives we must have had, how many times we must have done these things, how many times we must have done incredible things. Who knows? We might have been serving the past Buddhas. We just don't know. But what I can be sure of, what I really trust, is that everybody who's come in contact with the Dhamma and who's had the good fortune even to, you know, be in a reasonably um, happy human birth, you know, where we all have homes. I'm sure you all have homes, otherwise you wouldn't be on this retreat. You know, you all have the ability to take the time off. So this is already at the top, very top end of the human world. And we've heard the Dhamma, you know even when people haven't maybe heard it themselves, but they're around people who have. I always think that's a good sign too, so. Okay, one more question we'll do quickly. <clears throat> I love holidays abroad. It's wonderful to enjoy the scenery, culture, people, food, and it always helps me see just how all humans are really the same, the same needs and challenges. And it helps me feel united with peoples of honored nations with whom I've spent on my travels. Is this so bad? It is not bad at all. <laughs> and none of this is saying that anything's bad. It's really just pointing towards noticing where that wanting comes in and noticing the direct consequence of wanting, which is a kind of lack, right? Whenever you want something, it's that there's a lack. To me here, it sounds as though the travel is actually connecting you and helping to grow compassion and helping to grow empathy and a sense of um, a sense of perspective, really, an um, undermining of the sense of the self. And I relate to this very much because I've lived most of my life in Asia and I've, you know, served on like 60 retreats, managing these retreats for people from just about every nationality, Iranian retreats, retreats in like uh, illiterate villages in India with women who can't, you know, we have to play special discourses in their local language. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's only so many experiences that people come to me with on those retreats, and it's always within a certain range of emotions, um, the human emotions that are possible to have. So yeah, I think it ought, ought to be part of the curriculum for everybody to do this before they go to university or before they, you know, choose their life path, because it really does overcome so much potential racism and, you know, misogyny and just seeing that we're all human beings, we're sentient beings, and there's so much more that connects us than divides us. You know, the divisions, so-called, have to be kind of fabricated and ex exaggerated to exist. 
they're actually incredibly minor. Like we're one species, right? We're human species. It's not uh, even the idea of different race is very strange. So no, it's not so bad at all. And that's not what the Buddha is saying, but we can spoil these things by wanting them back and by then being very miserable when we can't travel. And I know that one as well, because <laughs> I feel less at home in my own so-called own country than I do in most of the world, ironically. So I can have the suffering that comes from that, but then hopefully the wisdom that arises is, is stronger. And you can also relate to yourself with more kindness, knowing that you are connected to everyone. I feel that my experiences with travel have actually increased my consciousness of the beauty and suffering of humanity. Exactly. So you have to know for yourself what helps and what doesn't. And just notice when you are kind of moving from contentment to indulgence, for example, you know, now I really need to get back to Thailand to have that, what, what's it called, that papaya salad, some, forget now. Anyway, or sticky mango, or I don't know what, palak paneer, my favorite Indian dish. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's that indulgence. It's, we're still not saying it's bad, like ethically wrong, but we are saying that there's a happiness much greater than that. So this is the main thing. Okay. Is that, uh, I hope that's somewhat helpful. Or anyway, it's all an experiment. And, you know, we're in the position of so called teaching, but really we're just throwing out ideas so that you can explore these things more for yourself. So. What are we on now? Okay, so now we're on Kamma. So I wasn't quite sure about the purpose of these next paragraphs, but it seems that it's basically to say that uh, there's a present Kamma result, Sanditika, and that means the kind of Kamma that's to ex be experienced in this life. And there's certain Kamma, certain actions that we do, where the result will be experienced in a future life, and that's called Samparayaka Kamma. But basically, they to show us that at some point there will be a consequence of our actions. And it's not to get scared or to feel penalized or punished, but it's just nature. It's just natural that, you know, what you put out there is going to kind of continue in a sense and going to bring some, um, mm, how can we say, some effect. Yeah, some effect. And the effect can be observed, of course, on the mind. And the more mindful you get, the more quickly you can notice the effect. You can notice it even at the beginning when it's just an intention. And if you're very mindful, you can actually stop acting on things that seem unwholesome. So this is very important to know. So with the five senses as the cause, the source and the basis, the culprit simply being the five senses, <laughs> and this is Ajahn Brand's poetic license, Presidents quarrel with prime ministers, politicians with each other, priests with imams, businessmen with householders, monks with nuns. Doesn't say nuns with monks. <laughs> Parents quarrel with each other and with their children, siblings with siblings and friend with friend. It's crazy, isn't it? We just want to quarrel. <laughs> and here in their quarrels, pulls, and disputes, they attack each other with abuse. I think I prefer the Pali, the original translation. It was their, um, something like they attack each other with verbal daggers, <laughs> which I think is really evocative, like verbal daggers, because actually the words can be much more painful than real daggers. They last longer and they go deeper into the heart, perhaps because we identify more with who we think we are than our actual physical body. So I think emotional pain can be much worse than physical, personally. So stabbing each other, I think they say, with verbal daggers. <laughs> uh, what else? Weapons or lawsuits whereby they incur death, injury or loss. Now, this too is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in this very life. The cause being simply the five senses. So this is kind of a bit more sobering, right? Than thinking it's okay to go and enjoy this, enjoy that. Yes, sure, for most people, it may not lead to really intense, unwholesome actions like this, but most of us quarrel. And why do we quarrel? I mean, what is it that's getting upset here? It's usually because we hear something we don't like, or because we see something that upsets us. You know, maybe we misinterpret what we see, but we are sure we've seen it and we're sure they did that. And we definitely know why. 
and um you know everything basically can come down to that so i think it's a real invitation to have a look and start dissecting our experience like what exactly happened that made us so mad and you can be pretty sure it's one of these uh, inputs that the five senses and here the buddha's also saying in a sense that it's inevitable right that when we have five senses these kind of problems are going to happen I mean, so many times, how much of the world's problems are based on greed, you know, or lost, adultery, you know, lusting for somebody else's partner, or wanting what somebody else has. It's really curious how the bigger the house you have, the more kind of gates and guards you need on it. I've always thought that was ridiculous. You know, you have this huge house and then you have to pay for extra kind of protection on it. It's like, why even bother? I'd much rather have only enough that I don't mind if I lose it. And in some places you can live with your door unlocked and, you know, you don't have to worry at all. I think that's much more wealth than having to protect and covet whatever you have. It's also really interesting as a Buddhist monastic to notice that it's not necessarily, we live on donations, right? We live on the generosity of others. And generosity is not necessarily related at all to wealth. You know, sometimes people say, wow, someone's so generous, they gave like £2,000. But if that person's a multimillionaire, and I don't suppose most people are, is it really that generous? Whereas somebody who really earns a pittance, say in Myanmar or any country, right? I mean, in this country, there's plenty of poverty, but in Myanmar, it's a very poor country. And, and yet these villagers who barely afford to feed themselves will come out and give the best of rice every single day to the monks and nuns, the monks actually, but you know, the nuns also come by with another kind of begging bowl. They don't have a real one. Unfortunately, there's a lot of um, disparity there, but uh, they'll be outside every day just for the sake of giving, you know, because they love to give and that gives them so much joy, really so much joy. So generosity has nothing to do with how much we have. And sometimes the more we have, the more unwilling we are to let it go. And I've often asked why that is. I think it's almost because the more we have, the more we think we need, because we're used to a certain level of comfort. It's actually hard to let it go. You don't know how to deal with less. And maybe you only need so much because you're not happy, right? If you're happy, do you really need so much? So really, happiness inside gives us a lot of freedom from the world and that's why we can gradually renounce more and more and more of this material stuff so there's some more here again with the five senses as the cause and it's only saying the five senses as the cause not craving for the five senses not attachment to the five senses just the five senses people steal commit fraud sleep with other people's partners commit domestic violence sexually abuse their children and when they're caught, they're imprisoned and ruined. Now, this too is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in this very life, the cause being simply the five senses. It's true that without those five senses, this couldn't happen. So yeah, here again, Ajahn's tried to bring in some modern examples to just make it real and make it hit home a little bit. There's some terrible things that happen in the world. We're probably quite aloof from this, but I'm sure not completely. And it can happen to anyone at any time. Sometimes we think it only happens to other people and then it happens to us and whoa, then you realize, okay, this is the effect of abuse. It's not that a person is somehow emotionally unstable or just crying for no reason, you know, it's actually a cause and effect. So I think the more we experience in life, the more we realize, okay, there are just causes and effects. And it's nothing personal, it's nothing wrong with us, but yeah, if we were in that situation, maybe we'd be similar to that person too. So the next one is the future karma result, Samparayaka, which is the opposite of Sanditika. So this is the kind of karma to be experienced in the next life. Again, with the five senses as a cause, the source and the basis, the culprit, I like that word, the culprit being simply the five senses, people indulge in misconduct of body, speech and mind. Having done so, after death, they reappear in states of misery, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. 
Now, this is a danger in the case of the five senses, a mass of suffering in the life to come. Having the five senses as its cause, its source and its basis, the cause being simply the five senses. So the point is that you have to experience that karma somewhere. So if you don't experience it now, you experience it later. And even if you don't believe in these things, you know, like future lives and whatever, the point is that you'd be pretty miserable now right? doing any of these unwholesome acts. It, it creates misery now. And I think that's the beauty of the path that we can experience the Dharma directly. And we can know it's almost like we have an internal monitor that tells us what's right and what's wrong. You, know, you feel really wonderful about yourself when you've, or just good inside, right? Even without identifying it to a self, when you perform a deed that's genuinely kind and generous and selfless. And you know when your motivation's a little bit mixed. Not to judge it, but just to notice. You don't get quite the same effect, quite the same uplift, or quite the same um, uh, enrichment in your meditation. That's another way to tell. So this is why it's so important to perform virtuous acts and to use the mind carefully in our everyday life so that when we meditate, we don't have all this kind of mess to sort out. You know, the uh, conduct that we've been performing in our lives actually is a, uh, a boost to our practice and gives us a lot of joy and things to reflect on to feel happy about. So I guess I'll carry on and we'll probably have some questions at the end. <clears throat> so the next is kama as volition. And this is the Buddha's definition of what kama actually means. Volition is kama, I say. So the Pali is chetana aham, uh, kama vadami. Chetana is volition, is kama. For having willed, you act by body, speech, or mind. And that increases the severity of the kama. Like if you just have the intention, if you just have the volition but don't act on it, it's still kama, it's still unwholesome or wholesome, but it's not as intensified. Whereas when it becomes stronger, when the intention becomes stronger, it tends to spill out into our speech. And then if it becomes even stronger, it's like you start yelling at someone and then you end up hitting them, you know, hopefully nobody here does that. <laughs> but, you know, maybe some of us have done it once or twice. And we know that, you know, we've gone kind of out of control. So we're really just increasing the intensity of that karma and the negative consequences it's going to have. Obviously, if you just shout at somebody, you might get away with it. But if you actually abuse somebody physically, then you are going to be in trouble, maybe with the police, etc. So it already has a, a much worse consequence for you and obviously for the other person too. And actually, the other person isn't going to suffer from um, negative karma. They're going to suffer physically, but you're the one that's creating unwholesome karma that's going to bring extra suffering for you. So although it may look as though the victim's the one who suffers the more, often it's the perpetrator in the end. And what is the diversity of karma? There's karma to be experienced in hell or in the animal realm or the ghost realm of afflicted spirits or in the human world and there is karma to be experienced in the deva world so i'm guessing that afflicted spirits is the ghost realm because uh yeah just to differentiate it from the deva realm because the devas are also a kind of um not solid like we are like that it's kind of spirit realm but it's a heavenly realm so and there are beings alive who see these devas or hear them Ajahn Brahm was talking about, you know, hearing heavenly chanting and uh, this happens in deep meditation that you can sometimes hear the most incredible chanting and it's like something you can never hear in this world. Like I remember once hearing this, I think I'm allowed to say because it's not like a Uttari Manusa Dhamma, but once upon a time, we're not allowed to talk about jhanas and stuff, but we can talk about other things. But once upon a time, I heard this chanting. And first I thought it was like the fan blowing or something. I was just resting in the afternoon on a meditation retreat. And then I realized it was like this incredible singing and there were like five different layers to it. Like, and it, it was just these most incredible tunes that you couldn't really make up, very kind of sophisticated, I guess, and completely in harmony in a very unusual way. And I didn't give it much importance. 
But later on, I wondered, you know, who knows what that was, whether it's the mind just playing games, playing tricks, perceiving things differently. But it was incredibly beautiful and quite otherworldly to hear. And my own teacher in Myanmar also, he was um, very deep in the practice. One of the other people on this retreat actually uh, was studying with him as well at the same time. And uh, and he used to talk about the devas just as, as simply as going to the shop and buying a loaf of bread. It's like, oh, yeah, this deva came today and looked like this and looked like that and said this. And, uh, you know, this part of the monastery has got good spirits around and this part of the monastery, there might be a bit of disturbance. So one day I heard him, uh, my friend heard him, actually, they are another nun heard him walking around our kuti like in the night about 3 a.m. because she heard a little cough. And uh, he was just chanting to kind of remove some of the disturbance from some of these beings who were not yet used to having us around. And one of the advices he used to give me was that wherever, whenever I would go to a new place to meditate, say like a new room in the monastery or like a little um, hut or cave, to ask permission, first of all, from those devas, um, whether or not I could be there. Oh, okay. <laughs> the computer has a wire loose and um he'd say you know always respect that there might be invisible beings in these places and just say to them you know okay please may i be here i understand you know it's your home i'm just a visitor and i'm going to practice virtue i'm going to practice meditation so i'm going to share the merits of that with you <laughs> And I made that a habit for a while. And it was very lovely, you know, whether they were really there or not, because I didn't see them. But, you know, it, it felt very respectful just to, I don't know, like have the idea that maybe there's something there that we don't see that is nevertheless, you know, grateful for our goodness and, and would love to share our meta and our merits, our meritorious deeds. <laughs> While I was speaking about that, it was so lovely to see this beautiful cat <laughs> standing behind you, one of the retreat participants. <laughs> really beautiful. You know, all these beings, they pick up on peace, they pick up on metta, and they come close to us. Yeah, even animals, right? During my retreat, I was in Perth recently on a six-month retreat. Got a bit disturbed towards the end by business, actually by reorganizing this retreat mostly <laughs> after four months. Um, but the first four months were in total solitude. And I started noticing, like sometimes on retreats, you think, oh, I'm not really getting that deep, but actually I was quite happy and content. Um, but one of the reasons I knew that I was developing in meta and loving kindness was because I'd start talking to all the little creatures even little um, ants and saying, oh, sweetheart, just move over here, <laughs> like calling them sweetheart. <laughs> and then at one point, um, when it got a bit warmer, these beautiful blue tongue lizards started to appear. And uh, I used to put some of my leftovers on, under a tree. And then I noticed one day there were two of them there, like friends waiting for the food. And within about two or three days, they figured out where I live and they'd come at about lunchtime and they'd kind of tap on the door because they're a bit too big to get under the gap in the door onto my walking path. And they'd like almost knock and I'd <laughs> open the door and there they are waiting for their food. You know, it's so lovely because metta and uh, goodness and virtue attracts all these beings. And I'm sure this helps to give them a better birth. It's like they become acquainted with human beings and start to yeah almost behave in a similar way another time I went out my back door they hadn't knocked um, and I didn't know they were there and I went out my back door and they were there lined up two of them <laughs> one behind the other just on time anyway I promise to get through this so I'll continue reading and uh, we can always go a little bit over with questions if you have them so now we've uh, discussed all these other beings and what is the result of karma? The result of karma, I say, is threefold. To be experienced in this very life, or in the next life, or in some subsequent life. Just to say that there are many lives, and if you don't get it now, you get it later. And if you don't get it later, you get it even later. So uh, better to make an end, I think. Okay, next, inheritance of deeds. Anger to a 10, 216. Page 17. 
Beings are the owners of their karma, the heirs of their karma. They have karma as their origin, karma as their property, karma as their resort. Whatever karma they do, good or bad, they are its heirs. So if you want to say who is your um, heir, maybe it's not your son or daughter or granddaughters or great granddaughters, but it's your karma because that's what we take with us, nothing else. You know, when the mind does separate from the body at the time of death, it's running on its own karma. It's running on its goodness or otherwise. And it's that that's going to determine where you end up and the kind of experiences you have later on. But I asked Ajahn about this once because I thought it's funny that we talk about things being non-self and yet here we say we own our karma. We're not meant to own anything, right? And he said, yeah, that's because this is for the non-stream winner. This is for the putto jana, the ordinary human being. But actually, once you don't own it, once you don't own your karma because you've seen that there's nobody in here, you've seen through non-self, then you kind of free yourself. You almost disinherit yourself. So you're no longer an heir, at least to the karma that can take you to the low realm so that's the get out clause in terms of karma we can overcome the karma that could um, ensue in you know very uh, birds which are full of suffering birds in the animal or spirit or hell realms that kind of karma is overcome once we see through the illusion of a self so whatever karma ripens Whatever the, oh, sorry, wherever that karma ripens, it is there that you experience its result, either in this very life or the next life or in some subsequent life. Hmm. So that sounds as if it's almost forming. It's almost like the karma forms a place where we can actually experience it. There has to be some, it's like a force, isn't it? Like a force that continues, maybe an energy, a non personal energy but something that has to manifest somewhere that it can be experienced. So again, it's a little bit on the theme of yesterday and these like endless beginnings, or is that right? Infinite beginnings, endless ends. <laughs> there comes a time when the great oceans dry up and evaporate and no longer exist, but still I say, the Buddha says, there's no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. There comes a time when the Himalaya, king of mountains, burns up and perishes and no longer exists. But still I say there's no making an end of suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. I love that translation, addicted to wanting. Because that's the wanting to want, isn't it? And we've become an addict. We don't know any other way. That's what I said earlier about the habit energy. It's kind of a habit that we've acquired. And when it doesn't work, we want even harder. <laughs> you know, we just think that wanting is the way we're going to get what we want. But actually, it's the opposite. It's actually letting go of the wanting. It's very counterintuitive and yet so simple in a way. There comes a time when the planet Earth burns up, turns into cosmic dust spreading throughout the universe and no longer exists. But still, I say there's no making an end to suffering for those beings roaming through rebirth and death, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. So even though there may be terrible global warming and this Earth may not last so long, still, the comic forces inside us that have to be re-experienced will find a place somewhere. Maybe we'll hang out in the Deva realms, probably most of you, unless you can actually get enlightened in this life and make an end of it all. But somehow or other, you know, this will continue even through the Big Bangs, as Ajahn Brahm was saying through his theoretical physics um, and his understanding of that, that there are many Big Bangs and uh, many, many universes. So... In a way, that can bring some relief, right, as well. You can think, oh, God, I've got to continue all these eons. But in a way, like, if you don't do it this time, you do it next time. So it gives us a lot of chances. I think it can be seen in a positive light as well. So are there any questions for the last little bit? Okay. Okay. 
So someone's asking, why is the sixth sense left out in these passages, the causes simply being the five senses? And I think the reason for that is because all these effects of the five senses here are experienced in the five sense realm. So <clears throat> it's five sense world stuff. Monks argue with nuns, not vice versa. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, monks do argue with nuns, actually, especially about whether we're legitimate or not. And I always wonder why, because it's not their business, really. It's our business. Anyway, that's my take. I mean, it's the Buddha's business. It's the Buddha's business, right? And the Buddha said it's fine. So that's my argument. <laughs> I won't say anything more. But yes, basically, like all this is happening in the five sense world, you know, the sexual abuse, the domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. It's because of craving related to seeing, smelling, tasting and touching. These are not cravings for the pleasures of the mind. So, I mean, that's a brief answer, but... I want to try and get to the other questions as well. Generally speaking, I mean, you can, of course, do unwholesome karma with the mind, but generally speaking, like the pleasures of the mind are more refined and more wholesome, especially the pleasures of things like jhanas and, and meditation states, things like inspiration, joy, generosity, you know, not much harm comes from this. So usually our anger and ill will and our craving is related to the five senses. It's much more coarse. Okay, there's another person who's asked a question. I'll go to the other question first, just in case anyone needs to leave, but I will finish both. During jhanas, are we perceiving something with the mind, kind of tuning to something? If so, to what? Not the smartest question alert. <laughs> okay, so this is the second question. Are monks and nuns not allowed to talk about jhanas or no one is? Is there a reason for that? Thank you for all your patience, wonderful teachings and explanations. So I'll answer the second question first. It's not that we're not allowed to talk about jhanas or that no one else is. It's just we're not allowed to make claims. We're not allowed to actually say, I experienced jhana. I didn't experience a jhana because the Buddha didn't want us to. Um, he basically didn't want to create hierarchies in the Sangha whereby people would only feed the people who were enlightened or on the way because that wouldn't give everyone a chance and it would also become very kind of favoritism and, you know, not very nice. Ajahn Brahm sometimes tells this story about somebody that came to the monastery when Ajahn Chah was, when he was there with Ajahn Chah and uh, they brought all this really amazing food, really extra special, you know, and the monks of those days were used to having quite basic food and were probably quite hungry. If you look at pictures of Ajahn Brahm, you won't believe it, but he's just skin and bones and uh, really not looking very strong, <laughs> very pasty and just like floppy. Um, so anyway, they bought this uh, food, really delicious food, a whole van full. And then when they realized that Ajahn Chah wasn't there, they actually drove away with it. <laughs> they took it all away. <laughs> and the poor young monks, you know, were so upset and, and sad about that. And it's, it, it doesn't really make much sense because you're not... Um, giving for the sake of like brownie points you're supposed to be giving with a purity of heart for the sake of giving to beautify the mind so that you can deepen your meditation and also to give people a chance right because any any of us not only monks and nuns any of us is a potential stream winner is a potential arahat fully enlightened being and we don't know who that might be I was on this retreat once in India and um, one of the teachers there at the 45 day course I was serving and the teacher there said, treat everybody as if they're a potential stream winner, because they may be. And I thought that was so beautiful, really beautiful. And it really changed your attitude, you know, to sort of admonishing someone that kept going out of the hall or, <laughs> you know, asking people to withhold the silence. It's like, OK, they're playing around, but who knows? Who knows? You just never know how close or far you are. So anyway, we're not allowed to talk about them because it's also kind of gross. I mean, talking about them and talking about oneself as having them or experiencing them is a little bit like missing the point. Because as Ajahn says, you know, they only happen when the sense of self disappears. So it just makes it rather coarse and attainment oriented to talk about these things. I actually think it's quite, um, for me, it feels quite off-putting. Um, especially because sometimes it's not a sign of progress if a person then doesn't 
hold keep their sealer right i mean at the time that they experience it i guess they have to be keeping it or maybe they force their way in but um frankly speaking it doesn't impress me too much and when people do talk about it i kind of wonder why um in my experience the more we practice the humbler we become so the first thing are we perceiving something with the mind as i understand it it's more a case that the mind unifies with the light so it's a something in a sense but it's really a reflection of the mind and there's a unity there so actually the duality disappears the mind becomes a kagata which means one pointed or one peak of mind and there is no sense of perceiving something what is there is pure joy a really deep sense of joy and in a way you could call that tuning into something i mean certainly pre jhana i've had um experiences where it was almost as though yeah i did feel i was tuning up to sort of a different frequency if you like um there was one particularly notable experience where um the mind was sort of peaceful but nothing special and i just had this word pop into my head from Arjan, i think from one of his talks notice peace it might have been notice delight it was kind of peaceful but not that blissful and as soon as that word popped in it was as though the mind just noticed something that was underneath the piece it was there i just hadn't tuned in because it was so subtle and it did feel like a tuning a fine tuning of radio waves and uh it just blew up in my mind really really hugely and, and almost instantaneously um so that was quite interesting but yeah for the jhanas it's more like there's a particular route in that seems to happen so yeah I mean, you have to be careful because the tuning in sort of happened naturally in that experience and it wasn't a jhana experience but um you know the deeper you go the less you have to do the less you the, the more that you do the more you disturb it so don't try to tune in it's it's an intuitive process more than anything it's a letting go noticing what you're holding on to noticing where you're kind of clinging where you're wanting and just relaxing around it softening around it letting go letting go letting go okay it seems there are more questions i'm not sure how many more i'm generous i'm uh, feeling generous so i'll do one more okay you choose please and then it makes it easier for me <laughs> i'll take one more question and you can always ask tonight if nothing was answered now coming 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 are you giving me a hard one <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay what is it then that is reborn if there is no self is it simply karmic energy yeah you could call it that actually you could kind of call it that i mean obviously that karmic energy manifests as a being right it doesn't just manifest as some kind of radio wave it manifests as a being um like in conventional terms but the point is is like not that there's nothing there there's no being there but it's not something permanent it's a process i would rather just say it's a process um of mind and matter that's reborn but that's not a very satisfying answer because it's not a very detailed answer um mainly because i think Ajahn Brahm's best at explaining this i mean he gives one simile of a mango and the seed of a mango and talks about how the seed of a mango is kind of planted in the ground and then from that a new mango a tree grows a whole new tree grows right and then on that tree you get the flowers you get the fruits and then you get a, a new mango so it's not that it's completely different from the seed but there's nothing of the seed in the new mango it's a, a different thing so it's it's like a process that continues it's something like a seed that's transformed into something new but that new thing is also always changing and that new thing also becomes something else right so that mango will also have a seed that will be planted which will make a new tree so in a similar way it's a process that just keeps continuing on and really the um way to understand it is dependent origination so when you look at the chain of dependent origination starting with delusion 
And then the part we focused on today was the feeling, creating the wanting, the tanha, creating the clinging or the fuel, creating the existence. It's a process. There's no body feeling. Feeling is feeling. It's not I am feeling. It's the feeling component of existence feels. The perception component of existence perceives. It's taking that idea of an I that it's happening to away. But of course, we can't get there by reasoning. We can only get there by breaking things down. And I think this is the point of these classes, in a sense, to say, you know, like the six senses, like look at your experience. Is there anything that doesn't fit into one of those six senses? And you probably find that there isn't. <laughs> I mean, that is enough to sum up what this thing is, what it comprises of. So there doesn't need to be a person that hears or sees. It's just seeing sees, hearing hears. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So it's not that there's nothing there, it's just that we misconstrue it as a self. It doesn't really deserve the name self. So how are we doing? It's seven minutes past. Uh, how many people are still left? Not everyone. Okay, so I think we'll end because otherwise you won't have your lovely practice time. And it's really good not to overload ourselves with too much. So there'll be more chance to meditate together and to have some questions later on. So thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And enjoy your free period. See you later.